welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us once again. And here we are recording as we have been uh, pretty often recently, virtually. We're meeting via Zoom and um, I'm in uh, Washington State and Glenn and Tom are back in Connecticut, not at the same location, but uh, we're all here virtually together anyway, and uh, we're glad to have you with us. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I'm serving a church in Vancouver, Washington right now, and uh, I've written some books. And good news for those of you who have been waiting. The final uh, draft of my book on Bombadil was turned in yesterday. So that's behind me. At least I hope it is. You know how these things go if you've been involved in publishing. But uh, anyway, everything should be full steam ahead with that and on to other things, uh, which I know someone listening is interested in having occur. Uh, Lynn, I am getting on to the next book in my Young Adult series. So Glenn's wife, Yay! Lynn, <laughs> is there. And anyway, so that's that's uh, that's that. I'm also working a little bit on the uh, the illustrations for my children's book. But let's move on to other folks. So uh, why don't we hear from you, Glenn, because it's Tom's day today. Okay, Glenn Sunshine. I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, uh, professor emeritus of history at Central Connecticut State University, and I got a couple of other things going on as well. Right, and soon, I don't know how soon, but the, the plan is that you're going to be transitioning from Connecticut to somewhere else. Are you ready to talk about that at all? Most likely I'll be relocating to the South Bend area, assuming we can get our house together um, and ready for sale before the interest rates shoot up. Yeah, right, right. Um, so oh, and speaking of, of the South, South Bend, actually just a little north of it, uh, this coming Friday and Saturday, I will be speaking on critical theory and critical race theory in St. Joseph, Michigan. Oh, nice. Uh, nice. I will, I can, um, I'll post the information or send it up to Caleb uh, that he can share that on the, uh, when he, when the uh, episode posts. That's great. So is it a church, is it a school, something? It's a church. Okay, great. All right. Well, and of course, we're talking about South Bend, Indiana, in case people were wondering, moving into yeah. the vicinity of Notre Dame, Notre Dame or Notre Dame. Uh, the correct pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Notre Dame is a cathedral in France. Notre Dame is a school in America. With a great football team and heritage. <laughs> anyway, uh, Tom, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, maybe just take us right into the subject of the day. Okay, uh, Tom Price, uh, systematic theologian, Christian ethicist. I teach both at a variety of places, one of which is Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Um, lots going on this summer. I am in the process of writing projects. And the exciting thing about every writing project is it always opens up four or five more. So as soon as you're starting the process, you're, you can see you can see a lot of other things take place. A lot of this has been on the back burner, but I'm, I'm kind of happy to have a little bit of time this summer to, to give it full attention. Um, that's one thing. Another thing, I think next week I'm, I'm recording with uh, Chocolate Knox uh, All right. on metaphysics. And All so right. keep, an, keep an ear. I know the cross politics group uh, uh, kind of follow all that. So and for those who don't um, keep an eye out for it, we'll try to get more information of uh, how where it's going to be located and the like a lot of more a lot more things coming down the pike with that as well. Um, so, uh, anyway, I'll keep, keep people updated, um, as we go along with that. Um, now onto the topic of the day, um, before I give a kind of, uh, working title for it, it's, it's something that, um, we could say it's kind of can go by a kind of triad of, of return, retrieve and renew. <laughs> um, in one sense, today's topic is going to be returning to some themes that we've kind of been working through over the past, you know, over over a year now. What what are we now, time wise, with this? Show? You know, I think we're going on two years or more. Two years, yeah. yeah. Pl plenty, plenty of for people to listen to, um, and go back over. And so I do like to return to some of those things because sometimes we leave them open ended. They're exploratory. They're what we're reading, thinking about, or have you know done done um, you know quite a bit of work on. And so I would like to return to some things. Um, I would like to retrieve some things. I, I think that we we oftentimes 
um, have not drawn off the riches of our faith in ways that that we can to address um, issues of our time in church and culture. Um, so that's something our show is constantly doing. And again, we come at it from a lot of different exploratory angles um, and, and kind of we, we feel things out. So I want to keep doing some of that. And then I want to do, you know, kind of bring our kind of reform lens on things and talk about the way in which in this retrieval, we're not trying to repeat, you know, um, kind of go back to another golden age. <laughs> Um, everything needs to continuously be brought into conformity to Christ and, and even kind of what we would consider times at which certain things were there that aren't there now. It's not simply about going back and recreating those conditions. Um, there is an eschatological um, thrust, a move towards perfection and consummation um, that Christ has inaugurated and, and is coming, coming back with fullness to achieve. And so that renewal always is, as has to be a part of the vision. And so I guess a way into the topic, it's going to be picking up with some of the things Glenn was talking about last week of kind of how the Enlightenment um, introduced certain things um, into that, that impact us today in church and world. Um, and they're lingering. Their effects are lingering. And we can't kind of just rip ourselves out of those effects and act like they don't impact us. Um, but we are called to kind of um, critically engage them through the riches of our own faith and, and re divine revelation and kind of, you know, um, peel off those aspects that are grounded in, in distortions of truth and, and um, obedience and then um, kind of bring into conformity those aspects that, that are consistent with it. Um, and so I'd like to return kind of to the point of the big shift that happened in the West at a, at a certain point, which was what we could call the anthropocentric turn, the turn to the human being as the center of all things. Um, we've talked about different aspects of the history that led up to that. Um, and then we talked about some key figures, one being Descartes, Manuel Kant is another one, Rousseau, and different trajectories of that term. Now, one of the things that oftentimes gets um, lost in, in that conversation is that we tend to think that that anthropocentric turn, that turn to the human being the center of all things, um, was largely for the secular person, um, was largely for the, the person who isn't a, per, a person of the Christian faith, who has God and God's glory at the center of things. And one of the things I, I've kind of hinted at, and we've all hinted at um, at different times and places, is that this kind of way of viewing things is actually quite wrongheaded. Um, one of the things we start to see is those shifts in conceptions of God, which lead to a new conception of the human, which eventually lead to a human centeredness, often ground their religion and relationship to God in the very conditions of the human being rather than in divine revelation and, you know, both natural and um, supernatural. And so what you end up getting is God is basically the counterpart that underwrites my human project, the functionalization of God. God is, even the glory of God is really nothing more than my own glory being, being um, underwritten. Um, and so we, we often, when we don't have a proper view of God's transcendence and who God is in and of himself and my orientation to that, um, then what we end up doing is creating almost a, a Feuerbachian straw man in which God is basically um, the human being idealized and, and abstracted from itself. And yeah, so we just, just so we give folks a little bit of background here, because you're throwing some some, <laughs> lot some, some, some truth at us with, with, a, with a fire hose there, Tom. <laughs> you can tell but, I've been reading. <laughs> <laughs> but when we when we, th when we think about Feuerbach, one of the ways that people can maybe understand Feuerbach, Feuerbach was a precursor to Marx. Marx used Feuerbach's sort of a way of thinking, but essentially uh, it also has parallels with kind of a Freudian way of thinking about God. In, in other words, there's a projection. God is a projection. You know, we are projecting kind of the idealized human being into the sky. And there's a kind of alienation that occurs because of that process. And Feuerbach 
uh, was trying to get us to stop being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, you know, that idea. Yeah. Not so much in the sense of being more useful to society, but having, you know, because he, he believed that this was a, a delusion or an illusion. Uh, we needed to kind of get back in touch with our, with our, with ourselves. And so, but this brings us back to this whole matter of, you know, human centeredness. Yeah. Which goes way back. I mean, this isn't yeah. like a new thing. We've got Protagoras. Wasn't it Protagoras who said man is the measure of all measure things? Measure of all things, yeah. Right. So we, the sophists back in, you know, Athens, you know, which is, there's a great story about, you know, Emerson mm-hmm. Hall at Harvard. I mean, you guys probably have heard it where, you know, when the hall was being constructed, they were going to put a Protagoras, uh, that quote from Protagoras above the door, you know, man is the measure of all things. And uh, I think it was the president of Harvard got wind of it. And, uh, decided to change the inscription to what is man that you are mindful of him from the Psalms. <laughs> so if you go to Harvard today, if you go to Emerson hall, that's what it says above the door that, that takes you into the philosophy department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well that, I mean, that, that fits right in. And actually a really uh, a book, you know, I kind of found hidden in the shelf that I kind of returned to. I don't know if you remember that really large book that came out some years ago at the origins of modern atheism by Mike Buckley, Michael Buckley. I do um, yeah. Well, he, he ended up doing a, a smaller version of that book. And I'm, I'll just be honest, it's not easy reading for, for the lay person, um, but for someone who wants to press through and, and see what happens when oftentimes for good reasons, Christians trying to, to defend the faith, um, during the conditions in the Enlightenment, um, they end up conceding ground and ending up creating the conditions for the kind of atheism that arises. We've talked about this before, and Feuerbach is one example. But Michael Buckley has a book called Denying and Disclosing God, The Ambiguous Progress of Modern Atheism. But it really traces this, and especially into the evangelical world, the way in which um, this different conception of God and the human being um, um, enter into a picture that really isn't the classical vision as the way most theologians and Christians um, understood the faith for ages. It, it was really a shift, and this created a whole new game that eventually leads to the anthropocentric turn. So I guess the short answer is um, bad theology leads to bad outcomes. And, and this is, this is one of them. And again, who would have thought it? <laughs> and this is what, and, and you can't escape it. So anyway, let's get down to kind of like where we were hitting at last week is the, well, since we've taken a anthropocentric turn, what does it do to the self? What did the, the modern world do to the self? Um, we've talked recently about Carl Truman's new book, I think, which, like you said, uh, ties together a lot of these other sources into a very digestible uh, volume. Um, but one of the things we, we we see is that the Enlightenment sort of still held a classical notion that there was some kind of essential self, but it changed the conditions and ground of it. It was now, you know, as, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, man beginning only with himself, right? So human rationality grounded in the human, not in, in the eternal logos, um, now becomes the, the ground of the human being and then every everything around it. But there is an essential self that is the enlightenment configured human, you know, rational soul, if you will, or rational being. I don't yeah. know if Locke really held a soul. Yeah, now, just, you're going to need to, for some of our listeners, you will want to define what you mean by essential self. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important because, uh, like, if we think about Kant, yeah. you know, we we uh, are looking at a guy who believed that basically uh, reason works the same for everybody, and yeah. he's trying to understand its workings. Uh, we can't really, you know, sort of participate in each other's lives uh, in the sense that maybe people earlier thought we could, but it's, so in other words, we're kind of all on the outside of each other as we are on the outside of kind of. Uh, the, you know, when you talk, you talk about the noumenal versus the phenomenal, we're kind of on the outside and we believe that there is a God, but we can't really participate or access that God. That Same God. thing is true for us. But so there's kind of an intersubjectivity. And there's, yeah. an, there's this weird kind of objective subjectivity that yeah. Kant uh, is working with. And a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers are working with because reason is just in your head. You yeah. know, not like it was, you know, reason wasn't the logos that yeah. permeates all things. Yeah. We could never know it 
we could because of this this kind of divide between us participating in reality we could never know it in itself we can only kind of project it on the things and so with that that's what i mean by an essential self means our essential nature so the enlightenment still held predominantly that we had a real nature we had something that it it was to be a human and to be a human for some in the enlightenment it was to basically be a reasoning agent your rationality but rationality again not participating in a rational cosmos oriented towards the divine mind but reason basically as a faculty that we have and is grounded in us as the center point and reference of all things um, but then you have sort of as you mentioned last week when the the kind of um, reaction to that narrow essential focus um, again, there, there were other, there was the empirical self. Um, that's another thing. I don't want to get too far off field, but that just, you know, that, that our senses in our mind are connected and that's the essential self. Um, and I don't want to get into all the details, but then we had the romantic reaction, which did not get rid of there being a self. Um, but what it did is it, it wanted to basically peel back the onion to the core and say that there was still an essential core there, but that core is really um, so hindered by the different layers of civilization, rationality, expectation, obligation, duty, um, that it cannot actually be, be liberated and freed to be itself unless we start to kind of peel back all of these layers, um, and this is kind of Rousseau's notion, you know, we are born free, you know. Right. Now, this was really uh, kind of a and it's a sort of a way that people understood um, themselves in the 60s. I think that sometimes we think of the 60s uh, erroneously as being the time in which people discovered this. This is actually uh, the phase, in, in at least in the American and Western world, in which uh, the Rousseauian way of thinking had finally become popularized. In other words, so we're seeing something that only uh, some people, you know, uh, bohemians, uh, you know, elites, intellectuals, artists thought, but now it's broadly, uh, you know, sort of embraced by the culture at large. So people would say things like, I've got to find myself. Like you'd, you'd find a, a man or a woman abandoning their children, you know, maybe quitting their job, like uh, tuning in and dropping out, like Timothy O'Leary said, you know, yeah. the idea that, you know, if you, if you just sort of peel away, as you said, all of these uh, roles in your life, if you just essentially basically abandon everybody and just become completely turned inward, then you will find your true self, your essential self. And so what you notice is exactly. So what you notice is you have, it, it, this is very strange. And I was just thinking about this the other day. You have a secularized. And what I mean by secular is no longer the Christian transcendent vision of, of God and then all things in relation to God, but basically everything, even God within the same universe, right? Um, and so you have it in-house, everything's in-house, nothing goes outside of the house and transcends it or permeates it from outside. Um, and so what you have is a law and in a sense, a secularized perversion of law and gospel, right? Um, law being the determination of me from outside of myself, whether it's by nature, natural law, um, societal obligations. And now we're starting to see the relationship of, of, of law to, it, it, and even theologically. And then you have this gospel liberated self, right, that frees one from all of these things to become the creative um, uh, agent in some way that it's meant to be. But you, 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 you know, the fun thing about this is, is you're, you're, you're a musician. I've got background <laughs> in visual arts, you know, Glenn's a musician. Isn't it amazing how we assume that if we peel away all of these expectations and social roles that we'll discover that we are the, we have an inner Mozart. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the, when we realize we have nothing to play. <laughs> or, or we have an, actually what we have is an inner finger painter in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have um, shown. Well, I don't want to go down that path. <laughs> or John, C maybe John Cage. <laughs> you're Glenn, you're you want to say Simon and Garfunkel in the sounds of silence. <laughs> yeah. 
So now yeah. everybody's getting out there Google and trying to find out who Schornberg was and all <laughs> that. Right. That's right. And so, but but it's interesting you have this now. I, I want to add a couple of things to it. Um, classical Christian vision and just classical philosophical visions in particular um, had had kind of um, two two emphases in the ethical life or moral life um, that became predominant. Um, and one of these, of course, was uh, something I, I want to get back to. It, it's um, it is was connected with Christianity in talking about not only their uh, God being ultimately the ultimate end for which we live our lives, and but also the fact that God is the ultimate enrichment of our lives. I mean, the 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 fullness of being a human being is in communion with the eternal God. Um, and apart from this, um, even proximate ends functioning as final ends, right, as ultimate ends become idolatrous and destructive. When oriented the right way, they become flourishing and liberative. Um, and one of the core parts, Glenn has talked about this before and Chris other times, is was that, that we find our joy or our complete happiness in God. The happy uh, beatitude being a divine perfection, and we are made to know God, as Westminster said, and enjoy God eternally. Um, uh, I think I think it'd be good to stop here and just quickly note <clears throat> that there's a lack of self-consciousness in the in the beatific vision. Yes. It's not like you're you're thinking, oh wow, here I am in God's presence enjoying God. It's yeah. like you just completely are wrapped up in God to the point where you forgot about yourself. That that's right. And in that you're fulfilling your nature. That's what I mean think about image of God, right? You you aren't God nor are you a human being distinct from the image of God. You are what you are as the image. So as you are oriented to God fully and receiving and loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, everything about the rest is, is, is fulfilled and perfected. And so the, this, um, this talk of beatitude, which we'll get back to, I don't want to go down that trail yet, um, finding one's completion in God, old way of talking happiness. Now, what we get with the imminent frame and we, we bracket the transcendent out is and inside this world is the place where we've got to find that completion and that happiness. So it's no longer in the God who transcends all things as the infinite source of everything, but now is located within that realm of everything else. And so as this is what Charles Taylor will call an imminent frame, right? We still want to flourish. We still have valuations, but they're, they're this worldly. Um, and so, and then we tend to, in that framework as Christians, we tend to pivot. It's either this worldly kingdom or it's so high and mighty, it's of no earthly good. So we work with this wrong polarity of transcendence and imminence um, rather than, than the classic one. Again, I'll get back to that. But yeah, why do I mention huh? this? Mm -hmm. A quick thing. Um, th th there are some ironies here when you look at the way thought develops during this period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked last time about the rise of rationalism, which leads you into deism. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that God is uh, the creator but doesn't muck around with it after he, he basically kickstarts the universe. Yeah. Now, now, when you think about it, what you get with deism, uh, well, let's start with classical theism. Classical theism says God is both the creator and the sustainer of the universe. Yeah. God is both transcendent and imminent, and God is both infinite and personal. The deist says, I'll take column A and throw out column B. Yeah. God is creator, transcendent, and infinite. He is not yeah. the sustainer, imminent, or personal. Yeah. Now, the irony about that is that once you do that with God, you place human beings completely in an imminent frame and make him essentially irrelevant to their lives. Yes. In the name of expanding his glory. Yep. In the name and, and, of, of honoring his transcendence. Yes. And, and connected to that, I didn't want to lose this. this is, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a second emphasis that, that arose, especially, I mean, it has been there all along, but its its distinct emphasis in the imminent frame arose. Um, it, it really even got carried along with the Reformation, other things. And this is where we moved away from God being the plenitude and source of our enjoyment and happiness to God being basically an authority commanding us. 
So Luther's traumatized by this notion of divine command theory, that, that there's law, and this law isn't about our, our enjoying God forever. It's a burden, <laughs> right? And yeah, because that, of our sinfulness, we are, we are crushed by it, right? Yeah, there's a kind of a heteronormativity that, it, that it's established where, you know, the law uh, uh, of God is so utterly alien to me. Yes, like that. I can't. I can't relate to it. It doesn't seem to to have any sort of interest in, in, in sort of like, just even my, you know, uh, uh, satisfaction in actually getting even a little progress in achieving it. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's right. And this and this is a shift because what has happened? We've talked about it before, but when God starts to be. God, it, you simply start to emphasize the power of God and the will of God in a more, I, I would say, influenced by Islam than, than classic Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. What you end up having is, yes, this your obedience is, is almost a blind obedience to an arbitrary, arbitrary command. And you don't know if it's for your good. And I, we talked about the reaction and the enlightenment. I know it dealt with the material conditions it was wrestling with. But you see this this thread in relation to its background understanding of God. And so you have a non-Christian, I would argue, understanding of law and divine command come in. That does not mean law and divine command are not in Scripture. But I'm going to show you in a minute how they're correlated. Um, how we we know. But one of the things that happens is is with what Glenn just said is these things get get ripped apart. We have on the one hand on offer God as a a kind of arbitrary divine will imposing commands up against us determining us from the outside for God's own glory, but not for anything really other than just us either being crushed by it or saying, yeah, let, let me go along with it. And so it's ripped from the human being actually um, finding, as Westminster says, our enjoyment in God forever. Um, so you have this. And so what happens in, is, is people start to, to, to kind of um, emphasize the human being and, and them being the center of all this. You have a conflict going on between my happiness or these arbitrary divine commands. And guess what wins out in, in the West? Um, my happiness through my own resources cut off from this arbitrary deity who may or may not have my best interests at heart. And so what are we doing? We're putting a shield up. Now, oftentimes we think this is just the sinner not wanting to submit to God. That, that's that's true, but it's also the sinner rebelling against a non-Christian conception of God. They'll rebel against the other well enough. Um, but what happens is, is there's a there's a new conception of God, new conception of the human, new conception, therefore, of, of law and ethics. You either have things arbitrarily imposed from power and the structures of power, like the family structure, the hierarchies we don't like, ordered to an arbitrary deity who may or may not have our best, or we have to peel back all these layers and liberate a, a, the human being so that they can be free and autonomous from all of that to pursue happiness on their own terms and what they feel is good for them rather than what is ordained for their goodness and, and fulfillment. So you get this, this, this tension that we see back in Christian ethics now imminentized into a tension within this imminent frame. And so what you end up having is uh, postmodernism comes along and it says, well, wait a minute. Yeah, um, we need to deconstruct all those arbitrary impositions of power and will that have determined, especially the marginalized, um, in such a way that we're all defined by those external determinations. And we need to have our voice. And the way to have our voice is deconstruct all these things so that we, and then what we end up finding when we deconstruct is that there, for the postmodernists, is no self there. There is no essential nature. It is nothing more than the epiphenomenon, the byproduct of these, these structures of, of power and relations, these determinations, these arbitrary wills to power. And so if we are going to have any kind of be an agent at all, if you can even conceive of an agent along this, um, it means basically being freed from everyone else's determination to be liberated, salvation now is seen as being liberated from all this arbitrariness to, again, to be set free almost in a, in a romantic sense, but in this case, 
you're actually having to generate a self in the process rather than liberate a, a self that was in bondage to traditions and everything else. So you're having to do more work now. You're basically having to create yourself ex nihilo in this postmodern liberation. And and we know that you can't actually do that. We have That's to work with the with the with the materials that we have before us. You know, we can't actually create things out of nothing. So that's one of the reasons why I think we see all the nuttiness with sexual identity is because yeah. you can't actually create a new gender. You just create weird sort of uh, amalgamations or cross sections or, you know, sort of a Frankenstein genderism. <laughs> we take this and this and this, you know. <clears throat> and, it, and, it, and it gets it. To, oh, Glenn, go ahead. Yeah, uh, two things. First of all, on a political level, uh, what you've just described really is the difference between liberty and license. Mm -hmm. um, again, the idea of liberty is the freedom to act within the constraints imposed by divine and natural law. And that is understood as being for your good. Once you lose the idea that there is a legitimate divine or natural law, all you're left with is license, which results in anarchy. And there, there's no political thinker who ever argued that, that I know of that ever argued seriously that we have a natural right to license. It's liberty yeah. that we have a natural right to. It's, the other thing, though, is, is sort of on a theological and linguistic level. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know Hebrew, but I've been told that the word Torah literally means instruction. Mm. And the trick is that when it got translated into the Septuagint, Torah turned to nomos, which is law. And I think that that did us a bad turn. Hmm. Because if you understand God's commands as instructions rather than legislation, it changes the way you think about him, I think. Yeah, I think there's a kind of uh, one way to think about that. Now, I'm familiar with this. And uh, there have been a number of, you know, works sort of working through this. Uh, but I think there's also kind of a heuristic character to the law. Yeah, there is, a, it is instruction, but it does also come with, you know, penalties and it's within sure. the framework of a, of a covenant. And um, which is probably why they use nomos in Greek. Right. So there is, there is a, uh, a there is kind of a, I guess a richer character to it than we uh, so seem to think. I think you're right. What we've lost is the instruction in, yeah. because in our, our language law uh, isn't really something that we look to, to learn. It's uh, mm -hmm. to learn about the nature of things or ourselves or how to live with other people. It's, it's just simply do this because I said so. And, right. and it doesn't have this other character or this, uh, this, this dimension that, that, that uh, Tom's talking about. And, it, and I think the Trinity, I think, opens up for us when we begin to see the, the processions of, of the Son and the Spirit from God as being the happiness of God eternally. We begin to see that the law is related to those kinds of relations between creatures. If you see that they're ordering us towards the creature the right way, loving God first and all things in the light of love of God towards neighbor, then we start to see those things as life-giving. Um, it's when we break with that, we see that we're bringing death, hell into in the grave into that set of circumstances. And they, they can't be, be together like that. I mean, that's, I'm going to get back to that. Um, before I do, um, because I'm going to pick up on Glenn's point again, um, but one of the things I want to say is that it, the, the point prior to that, where we were talking about the way in which we almost have no self in this postmodern understanding, unless... Every, unless we basically are the ones so self-determined that nothing can hinder our voice as being the dominant voice, right? Um, this is part, but this is part of why I see the identity politics we see today. Every identity is so fragile. Of course, they say, well, you know, white fragility or something because they want to play at the power arrangements to be benefit that particular group. Um, but this is well, what you're really seeing is actually the fragility of all of the other kind of socially constructed um, identities, which they're talking about is they don't have an essence that can last. It is completely one determined by the arrangements in which society is either giving them and, and they deny it's an either or condition. Either they have absolutely no they, no voice, they are not an agent or they are basically 
an agent having the dominant voice. This zero sum game between those that are dominant are the only ones that have agency and those that are not have no agency. And this kind of creates the frenzy around who's, who's going to actually have dominance to impose their kind of identity onto, onto the social structure and relations. Yeah, I think one of the things that comes to mind as we talk about agency, Tom, is when we think about agency in the sense that you've described, uh, it's completely embedded in sort of a social structure. So yeah. you have to do what I say because of my position in the social structure and loses uh, any connection with agency as it's often understood in other uh, settings, which lead to very secure self-understanding. So for example, in Shop Class's Soulcraft, Matthew Crawford's great book, he talks about agency as something that uh, is tied to uh, skill. So uh, when you actually know how to wire a room, you don't spend a lot of time worrying about whether or not you have an ability to make a contribution to someone's life. Yeah. They call you up on the phone. They say, my yeah. lights don't work, or I need you to yeah. wire my house. And you come over and you, you know how to do certain things and you do them and you don't need to brag about it. You just turn on the lights and say, well, there you go. And I think that one of the things that I think uh, sort of is a, characteristic of a lot of the thinking or uh, that, you know, I, I, that, that I, uh, you know, see with regard to some of this stuff is that we're talking about people who are advocating things uh, who really don't have any real practical agency in their own lives. Yeah. Um, so like when I think about, you know, who am I? Well, I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a pastor. Uh, I've got all these different roles and th these roles have to do with um, not just simply my position, but also my skill set. Like when, when it comes to being a pastor, now maybe you can fake it for a little while if you've watched some other guys, <laughs> but eventually, you know, uh, in fact, I remember uh, there was, a, I, I learned about somebody here in uh, the Pacific Northwest who had actually sort of been passing as a pastor who had no had no theological degrees. He had lied about everything and apparently was able to, to sort of, you know, it, it's sort of like that catch me if you can, you know, film, film, you know, it just, he'd been faking it till he made it. And then so finally decided to do a little research on the guy and discover that he, that what he said uh, he had earned in terms of his degrees, he'd never earned. And then he was outed, but <laughs> so, you know, there, there is a, and I'm, I'm yeah, that kind of took me down a rabbit hole, but, but, but the idea is that, if you focus on, uh, if you strictly focus on social structures and lose sight of abilities and skills, then you lose sight with the fact that agency isn't simply a matter of where you're born or who you are, the, the way the society's value structure works. There actually is kind of a basis for agency that's that has to do with uh, something outside of the whole conversation that people are having. And so I, I tend to direct people. I like when, when young men come to me and say, well, I, I feel like uh, I'm being blamed for everything. I say, you know, what I say to those, those guys is this, you know what, all those people who blame you for everything, most of them can't do anything for themselves. If you, <laughs> if you can, if you can fix, you know, plumbing, if you can uh, fix a car, if you know how to build a house, if you just even know how to write a novel, if you, if you can do these things, um, you don't need to feel insecure. In fact, all these people will, will actually turn to you for help. These people yeah. who think that you're nothing more than the, the, this white male oppressor. They'll actually look <laughs> to you as a kind of savior. And I've witnessed that many times. Uh, people who turn to me for help because I know how to do certain things. But anyway. Well, the, and that's, the, that's the thing. It's the denial of agency. Um, and, and, and the way in which someone do, isn't really a self unless they have power to, to project a self, um, it, it's not only radically dehumanizing, and, but, but, it, but I mean, it just shows you that um, basically what you have is a fundamentally untrue interpretation of the human being that is absolutely destructive to the human being and the culture. That's why we're seeing its byproduct. Um, first and foremost, it tries to understand if there is anything called a self, which is an epiphenomena of certain social relations, and somehow you identify with one of those as your core identity, whatever that means, 
because you don't really have a self, but you all of a sudden got to sustain an identity. And it can only be sustained if the societal structure is ordered towards sustaining it. So what's going to happen when any kind of force of nature changes things? Um, but also it's the fact that it works off of basically this um, radical libertarian notion of a self as unpremised at all. That means undetermined in any positive way from all of the created order. So it thinks it can gnostically, spontaneously generate a set of wants and desires that are going to achieve its completion and happiness, right? And if it can just get all these civilizational limits, onion peels out of the way, it's going to be able to achieve that kind of thing, which um, it thinks is going to be its fullness and perfection. And we see this, of course, with, you know, we're, see, we're seeing all the outcry from a lot of teens who were, who, who were told when they were having kind of gender dysphoria issues, all of a sudden, if you get these protein blockers, you change, you're going to be happy. And they go back and forth. Some, I mean, I know people that have been back and forth like four or five times. They can't, can't find where in that fluidity that happy point is. Um, because, again, it, 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 we're dealing with something fundamentally at odds with reality and reality now is serving as that incrent, you know, that, uh, that law against which um, they have to con consistently, you know, deal. And then we often, you know, the big question is, I guess the reformation, when we talk about renewal of these, these questions would, would ask the question is why is it that we are so fundamentally at war with reality? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's break one in the imminent frame. And why is it that our will is so in bondage, you know, kind of break two in that imminent frame that that, that starts um, to, to go the other way? Now, we've, we've talked about a lot of these things, but I guess uh, focusing on some of the other things we do is a constructive task of, you know, basically, I do think that if you want to talk about, we'll use language of common grace or, or our, our kind of um, being salt and light in the world. Um, I think we as Christians should be basically at every turn undoing the anthropocentric turn. I mean, I think that's what we need to be doing in our own uh, worship life and practice, thinking rigorously, um, not just in terms of transcendental things, but temporary things and the temporal, even the ways in which, I mean, a lot of times we think if we're doing something for the glory of God, um, that means we have to have that cognizantly present in every turn of the screw we do. And so that kind of oddity, um, we have to kind of break break out of that, that, that kind of, that way of thinking. But I mean, I think one thing is, let's just go back to scripture itself. Um, what do we have in the first of the Psalms? Blessed, beatitude, the Latin uh, translate, beatitude, happy, if you will, in the complete sense, is the one who basically meditates on the law day and night. So we have the law, we have that, that the scaffolding of divine command, but we have the tradition of, of happiness too. Our completion is found in, and, and secure is the identity of the one who will not wither or, or fade away, who meditates in the law day and night, right? This isn't legalistic conception of law. This is an imposition of law from the outside that has no good for me, but it's where we find our delight, right? Um, and then we go into the New Testament. Of course, we have beatitudes, right? <laughs> um, you want your life to be ordered the right way? Here, blessed is the, um, you know, the poor in spirit, right? And it goes through these things. Eventually, um, blessed are um, the peacemakers. Blessed are those that do all these things in accord with Christ, for they will see God, the beatific vision, right? They, this will be the reward of that. But one of the things you notice about Jesus and when he's talking in John's gospel, um, he, he's talking about, I'm the vine and my father is the vine dresser, right? But he's talking about every branch that remains in me is going to actually bear fruit. So command the commands are basically our our the instrument through which we remain in Christ. Of course, we understand that's faith now in, in Christ, the instrument of that. Um, but um, any that doesn't abide in him is going to be, you know, purged and, and burnt off. Um, but one of the things you notice in this is um, Christ says, if you abide in me, right, the, the union with Christ, and my words abide in you, right, um, you will ask whatever you desire, and it will be done according to your will, of course, because why? Your will is God's will now, right? Um, or oriented to it. But the next thing, by this, my Father is glorified 
that you will bear much fruit um, and you will be my disciples. As my father loved me, I also love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Oh, wow. Commandment is not this disconnection from the life and love of God. It's actually, and of course, this is love one another commandment going on here. You will abide in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and abide in his. Now, check out the next point. These things I have spoken to you that my joy will remain in you. Your completion, your participation in God's beatitude is now something you get to carry with you as you are obedient. If obedience here is not this imposition of this arbitrary will crushing us, it's actually the vehicle in which we are conformed to Christ and participate in him in the eternal beatitude, which is our chief end. And so what you have is a transcendent frame, the, the eternal trinity, coming down into time and space, Christ's incarnation, are being united to him in the spirit and being able to, to bear fruit, eternal fruit, the shape of God's joy in life brought into our temporal practice, relationships, witness, ethics, and everything else. This is why uh, Paul says, you know, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, listen to that phrase, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us up, um, free from the law of sin and death. You have a law going on in both cases, but one is the spirit of life, one is sin and death. And so what you have here is something that is much more bringing obedience and our completion into a deeper connection than what has happened in the church in the West. I mean, even the Reformation, because of Luther, of course, you know, he didn't like some of the, the, the stuff going on with this talk of beatitude and finding our happiness in God, because his view was, okay, the will is so turned in on itself that all our attempts to look for happiness are nothing more than, than um, self-love. And well, so- mm-hmm. Well, let's, let's think a little bit about that, Tom, because I think that kind of on the, on the ground, uh, yeah. people wonder- just what this is supposed to be like in terms yeah. of their, their life. Um, I think that uh, under the influence of romanticism, um, the emotive self has become the place where this is supposed to be known. Now, so yeah. in other words, it's when, uh, you know, we've sung, you know, the worship chorus for the 55th time and I'm sort of zoned out and I'm kind of swept up in the emotish, emotional sort of, surge of the congregation that I'm finally worshiping, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, so, yeah. so there, so, so, so people are looking to some kind of emotional sort of uh, dimension to this. Um, yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, obviously connecting that to ethics is hard for people to do because sometimes, you know, doing the right thing doesn't feel good. You know, it, yes. it can be yeah. humiliating. It can be uh, challenging. It can be fear. You can be full of fear. Uh, you and apprehensive about doing it. Uh, so, uh, you have any thoughts on you know how do we understand ourselves and you know in terms of you know as Christians going about our course of our daily lives, what what do we what do we uh, what do we look at or or maybe mm-hmm. that's even the wrong way to think about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that I, I think one of the this is I, what I, I was talking about a minute ago when I said I think our biggest challenge is this kind of undoing of the anthropocentric term is that sometimes I think we don't even know how to ask the right right questions. And I'm not joking. I mean, I don't think I know how to ask the right questions here because most of the time they become functional. OK, what can I draw upon a proper vision of God that can basically make everything OK for, for me and everyone else right now? Um, and, and, and I think in one sense, it is, it is starting to understand exactly what the New Testament and Christians throughout the de- generations have tried to talk about what we mean by fostering genuine communion with God and its relationship, therefore, to the moral and religious community in which that, that is to be um, embodied in deeper ways. And then we talk about kind of the, the wider ethical vision for that to be lived out, bearing much fruit. Um, and, and I think that's it. So I, I do think um, learning to, um, in many ways, pursue God for God's own sake, if you will, even though we, again, find our full happiness there. I think that is something 
I think we've got to really learn again in many ways because you're right. We're looking, for example, for we're looking for an, an essence to this this joy, this happiness, this completion um, in a place where we're used to finding it in our feelings, our contentment. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why the, the attraction to sensual and pleasurable attempts at happiness tend to, to even dominate the church or therapeutic happiness, right? Because those are things we kind of think, ah, you know, okay. And there is a place for that. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I mean, there, there is the byproduct of, of grace and communion with God is that joy permeate other aspects of our life, right? Um, see, it's surprised by joy. And I think this is more of a hint of the New Testament than, than we often give it credit for. Um, because I think of it this way. I always ask people, what was it in Christ that when people saw it, they would give up everything for and go with it, right? Um, now, I understand there were some this worldly people, a ah, great political leader. This is the one who's going to, you know, bring peace, you know. Right. And Yeah, I think, I think that, you know, the, you know, the joy that Lewis has talked about, uh, you know, is referring to, I think that maybe needs a little bit of, of uh, explanation because uh, the, the German word, if I remember how it's pronounced correctly, Zehnsucht, uh, is referring to not the sort of thing that I think a lot of people associate with joy in English. When I, yes. in fact, you know, when we talk about joy in English, we're often talking about this feeling of bliss. Yes. Uh, maybe because of something that happened uh, to us, maybe something sensual that we were experiencing. Whereas Zain Zucht was more uh, aspirational and actually kind of taking you out of the world. There was a sense in which you were seeing something that was transcendent, transcends yeah. the world, and you're kind of caught up in it. So like when we think about, like, you know, as a preacher, I get this question every once in a while, will we, will we get bored in heaven? Well, the, <laughs> the, the thing that I know, that I think that you you can, you can say about the question, will we be bored in heaven? Is you don't, is the people who ask the question don't understand joy. They don't really, they, they really think of joy as sort of a, a sequence of pleasant events that occur to them. Uh, I, what I try to do is I try to point people to something that maybe help them transcend themselves. Like I, I, I say, have you ever seen a sunset or, or something in nature that was so strikingly beautiful and awesome uh, that you just kind of became so caught up in it, you forgot about yourself. Yeah. In other words, that's what we're talking about. When we see the cherubim, you know, uh, ceaselessly praising God, it's not as though they're beating themselves, forcing them to sell selves to say the same thing over and over again. It's because they're so caught up in the majesty of God and his glory that they can't stop saying <laughs> that's right that, that's right that's right and, and you have this kind of interesting uh thread in scripture because you have on the one hand the 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 majesty of god which automatically undoes us of course because of our sinfulness and our creatureliness right um think of isaiah um and, and you know this 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 kind of response but then there is this in grace stability and graced all the way down ability to see in christ the face of God, if you will, the, the refraction of the face of God. And so that is where we kind of talk about, um, you know, the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom, but th there is this notion of wisdom and the pursuit of the joy of, of truth. Um, but where you have Christ talking here about, you know, let my joy be in you um, that I, I share with the eternal God. Um, this is something for which this group of people, when they had a little taste of, would give up their whole fishing business and everything else, right? The pearl of great price. And I think, and I, I just, you know, it's something I say is I think we, we have been so detached from that side of the, of the faith and what scripture teaches that I don't think we even really have an antenna for what is being talked about. I think maybe someone when they first uh, encounter the gospel and and have a very profound, if they if a, a profound conversion experience with it, has a bit of a foretaste where they they see this profound love for them that is undeserved, 
um, you know, and and yet is is the place at which that love is incomparable with anything else. It is where you completely are seen in all of your shame, ugliness, and everything else, and yet the penetrating eye of God's love says you're mine. Um, I think that's where you start to get a glimpse. I mean, the cross, again, is, is that kind of um, place as well, as well. And I think that's, I think, what Lewis is on to. And, and, and Lewis is also very connected to the fact that we look for it, it, that final and ultimate joy is not detached from other temporal joys. Uh, Lewis was really, I think he was using that kind of platonic language to communicate that, that, that there is in that finite garden that his brother shows him and he gets surprised by joy, there is that the echo of the, the final cause, our ultimate end, God's, God's uh, joy, <laughs> present there as the ultimate cause, not the proximate cause. So it's not that can of tin with the garden in it that echoes a certain kind of beauty that makes him long for a deeper one. That's really the place at which the, in, the, the visible manifests the invisible and turns us towards that which is the desire of our hearts. In Augustine's line, you know, the heart is restless until it rests in thee. It's, it's the same thing going on there is that it, it, it's rest, it's completion. Um, it's everything is found in communing with God. And so a lot of what we do um, is focus on everything else, the ethical life, the moral life, but sometimes um, we detach it from this ultimate purpose because we think that purpose is at the end when we don't realize that purpose should be governing every temporal moment and action and practice. We can commune in such a way that we have a taste of that in the now, the here and nowness of God's future. Yeah, and hopefully that's uh, happening um, <laughs> for people in not uh, uh, just you know the worship of the church, but in the course of, of life. You know, yeah. the, that's where the surprise comes in. It's uh, yes. you, you're not necessarily looking for it. It just kind of there's a moment where ah, this is uh, this is what. Uh, I'm seeing at the moment. Anyway, we should probably kind of begin to bring this plane in for a landing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Glenn, do you have any thoughts uh, on this on this subject? Um, yeah, but a whole bunch of things have gone flying by, and I think I'll save them for another time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I think that uh, for me, as you know, a pastor, the thing that I wrestle with in this regard has to do with how do I help uh, just folks who are being shaped uh, by, you know, our culture uh, uh, through media, but also through their relationships, uh, through even the laws that we have, uh, that yeah. we have to follow, uh, being shaped to think about uh, God uh, in an idolatrous way, which is, I think, what you're getting at, Tom. So we, we've, we've lowered our sights. We think we're talking about God, but we're actually talking about an idol. And... Yeah. Uh, what we want to do is encourage people to 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 do what you've been describing, which is see the pearl of great price, and suddenly everything is relativized. Everything is put into perspective, including my emotional responses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the uh, nature of my choices. I think that's a big thing. They are premised now according to that thick set of onions um, that we want to free ourselves. Actually, even though there is sin in it, there is some negative determinations and they were in rebellion against the good things. There's also God's final purposes connected to them. So your family life and ordering it the way God said that form. Another way of putting it is from God, through God, to God are all things, right? We owe everything we are to God. We're creatures, we're dependent. But there's that form Genesis sets up of life, family, be fruitful, multiply. That form is something God's cause. And then the final cause, bringing those to perfection. And all of that needs to start governing our conception of ourself, our choices, our relationships, society, and all the rest as they're ordered towards this, this highest end. Well, that's a great way to sort of to land the plane here. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good, that's a good spot. Since anyway, Caleb's flying in a few minutes, we'll <laughs> appreciate that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we really do appreciate uh, your support uh, for our show, The Theology Podcast. There are people who give it to us on a regular basis, and thank you very much for that. There are also people who uh, share the show with other folks, 
and our audience continues to grow. And we're grateful for, for that. And then when people give us a rating on various, you know, on different platforms, whether it's iTunes or Anchor or, or Spotify, uh, that helps. Um, and, and every once in a while, you know, we, we, we do see, oh, wow, a few more people have uh, indicated that they like the show and have, and have reviewed it. And uh, so if you, if you would do that, if you enjoy the show, that would be really helpful because uh, it really does apparently help people find us. Mm-hmm. And uh, last of all, uh, we're working on trying to get together, get the band together. Uh, we're working on a couple of different things. And, uh, you know, we'll let you know as those develop. But just so folks know, I'm going to be back in Connecticut uh, in the middle of July. And so at that time, I'm sure we're going to be doing a lot of uh, sort of live shows, maybe two or three times getting together, uh, trying to, you know, to, 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 to do stuff in person like we like to. And uh, we'll let you know about those shows as, as uh, time gets you know, nearer. Uh, we might put some uh, information up on our website, Theology Podcast website, or on our Facebook pages. And uh, if you're in the New England area and you'd like to be a part of those shows, uh, I think now with COVID restrictions being loosened up, you can actually maybe even sit at the table with us. We did have a couple of experiences where people came out to the shows and were told they had to sit at a separate table. Hopefully that won't be the case. Uh, But anyway, we'll let you know about those things. Anything else we should say before we say goodbye? Okay, well, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.